Good morning and apologies. This is why I do horticulture and not technology. We are three minutes late. We had some technical difficulties. So without further ado, let's move on and, and talk about more positive things like perennials for problem solving areas. Um, a lot of times we have issues and the things that we hear uh, that I've heard over the last 33 years at Chalet are, what do I do with my area that floods? What do I do with my area that is a hot box? Um, what do I do when I need tall screening? So what we're going to talk about this morning is that we are, as soon as we get this screen up here, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you some sets of difficult conditions and then anywhere from three to four solutions for each one of those. So perhaps this will expand your palette of things that um, you haven't thought about before. So without further ado, we're finally starting. Um, hopefully you all saw that this week for the first time, um, the handout is available online and uh, we're gonna save questions till the end and I will take, uh, like the past three weeks, I will take questions um, at the end. And uh, so let's get started. Okay, the Canadian wild ginger, um, the first, conditions are deep shade, dry soil tolerance. So these would be the conditions that you might have, for example, under a um, shallow rooted shade tree that not only has shallow roots, but also has a deep shade canopy. So you've got this double edge competition that makes it really, really tough. So you need some, a very competitive plant. And this Canadian wild ginger will really do this. Uh, you have this nice heart shaped leaf and it will, it runs along the ground it will seed. Uh, my experience has been that it seeds fairly modestly. Um, it's not promiscuous by any means. And you have these little tiny bell-like flowers um, underneath. And so you would almost have to be on the ground. And I believe that's nature's way. The pollinators just crawl around and get in the flowers and pollinate and then you get the seed. So grow it for the uh, ornamental foliage. And if you notice on the right hand side here, um, we actually have the European ginger which is a, uh, a cross a transcontinental cousin, but it has a much darker leaf. So the one that I'm recommending is a little bit more drought tolerant. Uh, it's the Canadian wild ginger and it spreads slowly. Ultimate height is perhaps um, six to eight inches, actually more like six inches, uh, but a very, very, very um, modest spreader. This is a um, genus of plants that I always think is really, really, really underutilized. And, you know, it's kind of a, it, it, in the spring, when it's on the benches, uh, people just look at it and think that it's just another perennial. And to me, this is one of the very, very, very most underrated perennial families that we have. Um, you have these amazing um, heart-shaped leaves and then these little like miniature columbine-like spurred flowers that fly over the top of the clumps in, in spring for a number of weeks, could be at least three weeks or so. And there's a nice color range, so they're oranges. Uh, I really like the album, which is the white flowered one, is very, very nice. If you notice in the bottom right hand corner, um, a number of them, when they push out new growth in the spring, you have bronzing of the foliage. So you have that little bit of those weeks of color before the flowers emerge, and then the flowers hover over the top. And it's a nice, neat, tidy clump former. So it doesn't run, it doesn't spread, it doesn't seed about. You can be very specific about where you put it. And while the clumps get larger, they, don't, they never become invasive or problematic. And they, there's a wide range of different species. So typically in flower, they might be as tall as 10 to 12 inches, um, but the clumps can eventually be 18 or so. Um, I always cut mine back. For those of you that have attended classes my, of mine in the past, you know I'm an obsessive compulsive gardener and I have a tendency to take everything down to the ground except my wildflower garden because um, these have very wiry stems. And after they have sat over the winter, they're somewhat difficult to um, prune and clean up. So I just go ahead and do it in the fall and have it done for the winter and then the new shoots emerge um, in the spring. It will grow in full sun. It does not tolerate wet. So that first year when you put it in, um, just keep it. If we get, re if you have it in one of these challenging dry situations, uh, make sure that you give it even moisture. And that's not every day. That's just let it get established. And then thereafter, it's extremely tolerant of um, 
shady, dry locations. Barrenwort, Bishop's Cap, both common names for the same thing, but uh, don't be put off by the fact that it is, you know, it's, it, it looks a little bit um, unassuming on the benches. It is really a tough performer. And when someone comes in and says, I have a Norway maple and I don't know what to grow under it, this to me would be um, a really interesting choice as opposed to trying to do Pachysandra or Vinca in there. Lenten roses. Lenten roses have really come on in the last 20 years because hybridizers have done wonderful things with them. Um, the breeding material, the species that they started with many, many years ago, the problem was um, nature in her infinite wisdom because these were blooming so early. And that literally in our climate means can be as early as late March, or early April. The flowers were downward facing. And that way they shed the snow and the pollen was still there and they could still be pollinated and they could still make seeds and reproduce. So hybridizers started working and they worked diligently to get flowers that are more upward facing so you don't have to crawl around on the ground in your garden and look up to enjoy them. So they're getting to the point where there are many hybrids that are outward facing. And the cool thing about the Lenten roses is you can have at least four and often six weeks of flower effect. And so you have these, this wonderful range of flowers. And if you notice, you have singles. And then that bottom center um, is a double. And many of them now have spotting and flecking and striping and contrasting centers. So the high, there's just a whole range of choices. You probably want to get main varieties so that you know exactly what you're getting, because otherwise if you buy a hellebore in bloom, um, you don't really know what you're getting. So best, as always, it's always best to know what you're buying. Um, these have evergreen foliage, and I mean really evergreen foliage, but the evergreen foliage varies from one year to the next. Um, if it's out where it gets a lot of winter sun and a lot of winter wind, and we have a winter where there's not a lot of snow cover, by spring it can look pretty ratty and pretty tatty, so you can, uh, you go ahead and do what we call dead leafing. And basically what that means in the case of hellebores is you trim off whatever doesn't look good. And then as, depending on how early you do that, the new flowers and the new leaves will be emerging together um, on the north side of a house as opposed to a, an east side or a west side. Uh, they might um, be one to two weeks later just because the ground stays cooler and they emerge later. But this is a great early season thing that is in bloom when the witch hazels are in bloom. So it really starts the perennial garden season and you have this beautiful um, foliage. A number of the new varieties have silver veining in the leaves. So even when they're not in bloom, you have a really, really attractive foliage plant with that leathery, leathery green leaf. Uh, let's see, what else? Is there anything that I've forgotten about those? No, I think not. Um, now we're going to the opposite extreme. We're going to full sun and hot. And so the flowering onions, the alliums, the alliums can confuse people because in the fall, when you buy your tulips and daffodils, there will be a whole range of bulbous um, alliums or ornamental onions that you can get. Um, the ones that we're looking at here, this allium millennium um, is a variety that is not bulbous per se. Um, but you have these wonderful summer um, lilac-y pink, pinky purple um, flowers with this nice strappy typical onion-like foliage. Um, it drives the pollinators absolutely wild. If you have a group of three or four or five of these um, alliums in the summer when those are in bloom, they will be really, really, really um, covered with bees. So that's, that's a great thing for those of you that are, those of us that are trying to promote pollinators. Um, Millennium has a, one thing you have to watch with the alliums is a number of them are somewhat um, um, prolific in their reproduction. So you want ones like Millennium that are moderately um, fertile, or actually I should say uh, predominantly sterile, so that you don't have the little seedlings popping out um, that you have to pop out of the ground. Sun, um, very well drained. If you notice this, that, that brick edging there, this is in a slightly res raised bed. So, and there's a driveway on the other side of it. So you're getting a lot of reflected heat. You're also getting very, very good drainage. Um, the alliums don't like wet feet. 
um, but a really, really, really nice um, addition. And there are so many of them. Um, there's another one called Windy City, which I have, which is a little bit smaller flower, and it's a deeper purple color, and it flowers later than the uh, Millennium. But Millennium is a really good one. It's a standard um, that you're apt to find on our benches. So again, that's a butterfly and the magnet. Speaking of butterflies, here is the butterfly weed, the Asclepius, uh, which has been so hot. So this is a, uh, as many of us know, this is a great nectar plant for uh, monarchs, but also a lot of other butterflies. It's not monarch specific. Now it is monarch specific in that the monarch larvae feed exclusively on um, Asclepius. So this is a good one to have. Um, it is um, taprooted, which means that you want to be very careful about where you place it because it's not something that is going to suffer moving around. It's not a piece of furniture. Um, you put it where you want it and then let it make sure that it sits there. Um, late to emerge, so don't worry about it if we get a little bit later into the spring, especially if we have a cool spring. Um, this one really needs the soil to heat up before it breaks through the ground and starts growing. So you might think it's dead, give it time. Um, so this is a full sun plant. It doesn't do well in shade. Um, it's fine and cool, but it tolerates um, lots and lots and lots of heat. Uh, it actually prefers dry. You might, um, some people, if we have an early spring and it finishes blooming and you deadhead it, with some of the new hybrid varieties, you might, and I underline might, so please don't call me and say it didn't, ha it didn't work, but you may get a second crop of flowers, uh, a lighter crop of flowers later in the summer. But this is a really good one for, if you're, if you're trying to incorporate into a native garden and you want to promote pollinators, this is a great first choice. Geraniums um, or cranes bill. This is a ground cover type. And again, this is a ground cover type that um, would be, if you don't have an overly large area, uh, this would be a great substitute for the standard for the ivy, the vinca, the pachysandra, the euonymus. Uh, you have this nice finely cut leaf and you have this right now minor in bloom and this just, you have this covering of these little delicate flowers, which bees really, really, really like. Um, in the picture on the right, it looks white, but this is as it finishes. The Biacovo is definitely a soft pink when it comes out. And then in a hot, sunny situation, as the flowers age, it will get almost white with a tinge of pink. The cool bonus to this plant is, look at the way, that's multiple plants, the way it fills in so it almost looks like one large low ground cover shrub. And the cool thing is that it takes on fall color. And it gets orange and it gets purple and it stays that way over the winter under winter snow. So I would say this is semi-evergreen uh, to evergreen perennial that really it stays just the way it is. There's no cutting back on this in the fall and in the spring, the new, by the spring, <clears throat> new growth emergence, the new, the old growth kind of just shrivels up and the new growth just grows right over it. So it's really, really, really low maintenance. Um, this is just a great perennial. It has a sister variety called Carmina, K-A-R-M-I-N-A, -A, which is a deeper color and when it's out in, in, in peak bloom, it is more of a um, true pink purple. And even when it fades, it's still a deeper color than Biacobo, but it has the same growth habit. In bloom like this, um, the clump you're looking at might be eight inches tall. So really, really, really good underused perennial um, as a semi-ground cover. I'm occasionally checking my notes to make sure there's nothing I'm missing because there are a couple of these that I want to specifically mention that for those of you that have black walnuts and have had issues with things not growing because of the substance, the toxic substance they would uh, uh, emit from their roots, I want to make sure that I mention those two or three perennials that I'm going to call out for, um, for that. Uh, the one thing about the um, geraniums here, they will not um, tolerate foot traffic. So this is something that um, you don't want to put near the basketball goal or where bikes come running in before you, um, before you dismount, I guess. 
Okay, this is probably, especially the last three years, um, this has been one of the most common questions. Um, what perennials can I use for periodic flooding? And this is a problem because a lot of perennials have a fleshy root system. And so if they are wet for prolonged periods of time, they die before winter. And if, even if they do have some moisture tolerance, if, there's, if they, it's a wet fall and they freeze with lots of moisture in the ground, a lot of them will um, not be with you in the spring. So I've chosen um, four different candidates here um, for literally for uh, floodplain situations where you either have rushing water or you have standing water or at the very least after heavy rains it stays saturated for days and days and days until we finally get into drought. So this is the hardy hibiscus and there is a native variety and there are many improved varieties and of course the improved varieties have larger flowers but you have a great color range on these lots of beautiful um, soft pinks deeper pinks you have these wonderful cranberry colors and there seems to be a link with the cranberry those darker flower colors also often have a deeper color to the leaf so that can be an ornamental characteristic and then you have whites and then there are whites that have bars uh, of cranberry coming through them so um, this is a great one for literally floodplain situations. Typically, they can grow as high as three to five feet tall. Um, in my heavy clay soil, they tend to get about three feet tall, and they're flowering in July and August. Some people have them flowering later than that, but usually I would say it's weeks right in the heat of summer. One thing that you need to know about these hardy hibiscus, um, as you can imagine, in years when we have heavy Japanese beetle infestations, the Japanese beetles absolutely love those big flowers. So you need to be prepared, whatever your favorite method of control is, especially if it's hand squishing. Um, I know some of you are cringing, um, but that's a really um, good way to biologically control them. And it's a very satisfying crunch when you get them before they have started um, shredding your flowers. The sedges. Now, it happens that the pictures that I have here um, are both selected varieties, so these are not natives, but the sedges, I, I can't talk highly enough or speak highly enough about the sedges and what they do. They tolerate standing water, they tolerate sun, they tolerate shade, they tolerate drought if they're in some shade, and I think they're overlooked. So this is a great way to use natives in those really, really hard to find places where you have combinations of wet shade um, or um, wet sun. They happily will grow in that. Typically, and I shouldn't say typically because there are over 2,000 sedge uh, species. So there's this enormous range of varieties available to you. And I have to say our selection varies from one year to the next based on availability. And right now in my situation that I call the Delta where I have periodic flooding, um, I'm in my second year with eight different sedges. And in the, that second year now in their sophomore year in there, it's incredible how much they have grown and changed. And generally speaking, even with flowers on, even the tallest varieties are usually under three feet tall. And most are under, uh, under mm, 12 to 15 inches, 12 to 18 inches tall, but they have that wonderful arching habit. They have that grass-like, ribbon-like foliage that are, tends to arch over, although there are some that are upright. And this, you know these are natives, so this is great food. This is great habitat for insects and um, other things that provide food for birds. Love, love, love the sedges. And don't be too literal when the when the tag says we'll do in sun, we'll do in shade, we'll do in wet, we'll do in dry. Um, I've been pushing the envelope, and if it says um, sun and dry or sun partial. I put it in full shade and let it get really, really wet and it hasn't affected any of them. So to me, the Carex, the sedges are one of the most versatile groups and these are something that are totally, totally um, overlooked. Leopard plant Ligularia. Um, unfortunately, this one doesn't have a picture to show you the uh, spikes that have daisy-like orange flowers. Um, there are a number of different ligularias. Some of them are more yellowish. Uh, Britton Reek Crawford is orange, and it has this nice green rounded leaf. 
Um, they get very big. These really need at least partial shade and they do need moisture. For those of you that have grown it, um, I'm sure you've experienced if you have it out, you did not want to put this plant out in a spot where it gets afternoon sun because if it does, even if it's moist during the heat of a, a hot summer day, the plant will look wilted and you'll feel like you need to get out there and water in the plant. If there's enough moisture, the plant will perk up as soon as it goes back into shade, but it is a plant that can tend to look a little wilty. So um, morning sun or dappled shade and even moisture, this is the way to go with this. And because of that big leaf and because you do typically put it in a, a, a moist spot, um, you can have slug issues. So that's something to be um, forewarned about. Like most things that have purplish foliage, if you if could reverse and flip these leaves, you would see a deep maroon color. And many of the ligularies will have a purplish cast. But when you get them, the more shade you put them in, which is typical of most um, purple or maroon foliage plants, that color will tend to um, green off. So it may be more of a purple green. The royal ferns and all the other ferns. Um, don't ever turn up your nose at ferns. Don't, you know, some people turn up their noses at hostas. Many people turn up their noses at ferns. Don't do it if you have shade and especially if you have wet shade. Um, I never really thought about it until many years ago. I took my first trip to um, England and saw, and it was a great Gardens of Southern England tour. And we were walking this amazing garden and there at the pond side was this royal fern that had its feet in water and it was out in full sun and it was probably four feet tall and eight feet wide. And I thought, how cool is that? So the royal fern is my first choice, um, but most of the ferns, you can test them by putting them in that difficult situation where it's lots and lots of shade, or at least a half day or more of shade, and then wet feet, and they will respond after a couple of years by making nice big clumps that really are the landscape equivalent of having an, another shrub in there. So really, really, really stunning texture and interesting um, just something different to mix in. And so if you have it at the, with, along with coarser textured things like hostas, um, it's really, really, really a nice companion plant for that. Um, the royal fern in my garden with, along Creekside um, gets three to four feet tall, and now the clump is um, about four feet wide. So it's really, I really, really enjoy it. And of course, when those fiddleheads come out in the spring, they're really cool to look at. Okay. The other big question that we get along with periodic flooding and shade is what do deer and rabbits not like? And so the still bees are extraordinary in no one seems to like the foliage or the flowers on them. And I speak from experience and I'm sure someone's going to say, well, they ate mine, but I've never had that happen. And I have it next to other plants that the deer and the rabbits pillage and the still bee is perfectly clean. So you have this nice fern-like foliage. You have these beautiful um, spires that are in, occur in the summer. And the, the beauty of this is you've got environment resistant, so both deer and rabbit resistant, this nice fern-like foliage. And you have this incredible range of choices in flowers from white to peach to salmon to pink to maroon. Um, to varieties like Fennel, which are really almost red, and then the height differences all the way from 10 inches all the way up to varieties that in flower are four feet tall. So the, the proportionate, uh, the flowering is proportionate. The taller the plant, the later in the season they bloom. And I mentioned this, I think, two weeks ago in a class. Um, so I will repeat myself for those of you. I'm, I'm not getting old. I'm just repeating myself on purpose. Um, the flower heads on these dry really nicely. So if you want an extra season of effect, um, you can leave these up in the fall, or don't deadhead them after blooming, leave the seed heads up, and the foliage will shrivel up and flower, but surprisingly, the flowers will stay, the stems are strong enough, and the flowers are strong enough, unless it's, you get some really early, cold, wet um, snow loads on them, they will um, stick up through the, the snow and give you winter interest. 
Um, this is one of those plants that if you do have a black walnut and you have issues with growing things, uh, still be our um, tolerant of the toxin that the um, black walnut leaves secrete. Calamintha. This is, a, this is an amazing plant. I wish we had a picture of it. It starts out in the spring. It is in the mint family, uh, but it is an ornamental mint. And it has really, really, really nice foliage and pretty foliage. And then later in the season, starting in late summer, early fall, it starts having these blooms. Now the pictures show this as white, uh, but they have a definite lilac tinge. But if they're out where they get full sun, the color will give the appearance of white. And this one drives bees absolutely bonkers. They are always working um, the calamint. And it's, so they, it's a great pollinator plant. Uh, you can see that they get about 18 inches tall. And this literally has weeks and weeks and weeks of bloom. So this is a super plant. Um, and because there's a little bit, uh, I find it very clean and very herbal. There's a little bit of a fragrance to it. Um, and for whatever reason, the deer and the rabbits do not like it at all. They go, they walk right past. So that's a great thing. So you might suspect that this is a drought tolerant perennial. It actually um, tolerates heat, but it's best and will respond and will really prolong the bloom time on it if you keep it um, moist, if we get into really, really hot, dry um, situations. Um, what else? I think that's about it. So 15 to 18 inches in height and perhaps after a couple of years about an equal spread. It might even get a little bit wider than that. So this is the calamint. And the nice thing about this is it does not seed around. It's not promiscuous. So you plant it, it stays in place. Uh, and in six years I've never had a single seedling um, come up where it wasn't wanted or at all. Rogers, yeah, this is also another varmint um, resistant plant. This is another, in addition to varmint resistance, this is a great one for partial shade and wet, wet, wet soil. So you don't want this down in the floodplain where it would ever have standing surface water, but you could have it at water's edge or wherever the soil is a very, very, very last to dry out in partial shade. You get these amazing, grow this one, it does flower. So in the summer, you have either pink or white flowers, but grow it for this really bold textured foliage that really makes a statement. And it, it's a, even though it has the same texture as hosta, it's a coarser texture because of the way the leaves are arranged. When you put it next to hosta, they make kind of an interesting um, companion planting. And I think you can see here in the foreground, um, you can see those individual stems. So it's a, uh, I don't want to scare you. The minute you say colonizing, people get scared that it's going to take over. It will gently walk and it will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I have some clumps that are probably five feet wide and it's just perfect because they are so dense that nothing grows in under them. They have a tendency to make rhizomes that are almost like iris. So you have these woody stems that sit or or stems, I guess, that sit right on top, uh, root systems that sit right on top of the ground, and they literally choke out all the weeds. So you have choices between white or pink flowers, summer flowering. Um, they vary in height, um, but typically, if they're moist, they can get usually around three feet tall. With the flowers, they can be a little taller than that, but the body of the foliage can be anywhere from 18 to 36 inches tall. But again, no standing water on these. Wet, wet, wet is fine, but don't put these in a floodplain situation. Don't put these in a, a swale. Okay, now we're into clay busters. And what's going to be interesting about the clay busters is that these are all native plants. And native plants, they put down a tap root. And so they get down below uh, that soil surface where superficial drought doesn't affect them at all. And <clears throat> this is my particular favorite. Um, this is the straight species as it occurs in nature. And you have that wonderful uh, blue color and you have a nice pea-like flower. When this plant comes out of the ground in the spring, it looks like asparagus beers. 
So it's very cool when it first comes out until they get about 12 to 15 inches or even a little bit taller and the leaves start emerging. You have these things that almost look like asparagus spears coming out of the ground. So it's very fun to watch those emerge and then grow into this beautiful um, shrub that has a it's kind of a bluish, especially if it's out in the sun, there's a blue-gray cast off into the foliage and it's a pea-like leaf. So even when it's in bloom, not in bloom, you have this pretty foliage and they tend to make a really, really, really um, nice shrub and they get big. They can get three to four feet tall and three to four feet wide. So this is one of those plant perennials that you could use for a shrub. Uh, substitute simply because of the presence of the plant. On the species like this, when it finishes, um, the seed heads dry and they turn black. And when you shake them, they rattle. So this is something that you could fascinate kids with and help get kids interested in the garden. Um, they will drop the seed if you don't deadhead that. So you can have, if you leave them up for interest, um, you can have a little bit of uh, an issue with some reseeding. It's not aggressive, but you could have some seedlings coming up that can be easily pulled out the following year. Um, no particular fall color, as I said, taproot. So don't plan to move this one around. Know exactly where you want it. This is sun loving. Um, it doesn't tolerate shade very well. So I would say a minimum of four to five hours of sun. Probably no winter interest with this. So it's something you'd probably cut back. Um, excuse me, in the fall. Um, some people like to cut it back um, after it flowers um, so that it doesn't flop. I've never had that problem. Um, I've always found that the stems are really strong and the plant is self-supporting, so it doesn't really need any, uh, the flowers are not heavy enough that they drag the plant down like an Annabelle hydrangea. The other thing that should be mentioned is Dr. Jim Alt has done amazing things uh, through his breeding program at Chicago Botanic Garden. So there are all kinds of colors available now. So if you don't want to have this, this blue color, there are all kinds of different color options. Um, not so much heights because they all tend to make this same nice big roundy moundy shrub, but you have great, great, great color options. Um, these have just finished flowering in my garden, so it's a little bit later than usual, but this is what I would call a late spring blooming plant. The spike gay feather, the liatris, again, clay buster uh, native, puts down a tap root. And this is unusual in that you have these wonderful um, pinky, purple, bottle brush-like flowers. But it's one of the few things that flowers, if you notice, from the top down. So that's um, a little bit unique in the plant world. And you have this nice um, feathery foliage. Um, this one gets about 18 inches tall. And um, it's really, really, really good in clay soils where other perennials um, might turn up their noses um, a little bit. Um, deadheading is probably preferable. Um, this is really a sun lover. Uh, I wouldn't push the shade on this too much. You really want at least five to six hours um, of sun on these. They're long lasting. So from the time they start at the top and they bloom down, it's literally, literally, um, weeks of color, and there are dwarf varieties like Kobold, which only gets 18 to 24 inches tall. And because it's a native, it's rock hardy over the winter, not an issue at all. This is a selection of our native switchgrass. Um, it's a variety called North Winds, which was made by Roy Diblick, who is just an outstanding um, plantsman and native plant um, promoter extraordinaire. And again, the nice thing about these clay busters, this plant puts down a deep root system. And the thing I like about Northwind is, unlike the other switch grasses, it has a slightly uh, broader leaf and there's a little bit of a blue cast to it. So, and it hasn't been overutilized yet, like some grasses that I might name, but won't name. So it's very vertical. Um, ultimately can be easily five feet tall and you have that little bit of a bluish cast to it. The flowers are the typical switchgrass. It's a light airy um, little piece of business that's maybe um, a little bit kind of a yellow uh, cream color. 
and this will turn cream in the fall. And unless you have a really early, heavy, um, wet snow that's right at the freezing point, so it's almost like rain snow, um, and that freezes on top of it, this is a very self-supporting plant. So certainly during your growing season, it will um, support itself. It doesn't need any kind of staking or uh, corralling with twine and bamboo stakes. But in the winter, um, it will also stay up, unless, as I said, unless we get an early um, winter wet ice snow that will take it to the ground. So some people, um, if it's in a high visibility spot, you might want to cut it down in the fall. Otherwise, you leave it up and then take it back to the ground and do your winter cleanup on that um, in March. While most of the grass is like a well-drained soil, this one is very good in a wetter soil, not standing water. I didn't say standing water. I said moist or wet. And so it will respond to that very well. So this could easily be in its second year after it's established. This could be five feet tall. And the overall width as it arches over uh, might be 30 to 36 inches um, wide. While it's a really strong plant, um, you could use it as kind of a punctuation point, but probably better in a repetition of groups of three to five in a staggered clump to really make a statement. So that's the clay busters. Now we get into taller. These are the, and again, most of these are natives. And so there you can see um, the pollinators love it. So the Eupatorium, the Joe Pie weed is a, again, one of these big bulky plants that has the presence of a shrub in the uh, perennial border. It's summer blooming. And I like the fact that you have before it flowers, you have those nice maroon stems and then you have that dusty um, pink um, flower um, that again, the pollinators really like. So this is a big plant. Make sure that there, while there are uh, dwarf varieties, Gateway is supposed to be a selected variety that's more compact, um, but it still gets four to five feet tall with a four to five foot spread. Um, then there is a variety called Little Joe and Little Joe only gets three to four feet tall and three to four feet wide. Um, this is another one that you could leave up over the winter and you may get some birds coming in um, for the seeds on that. Full sun, uh, this is self-supporting, so typically you don't need to stake it. If you put it in shade and or if you tried to fertilize it um, and push the growth on it, even stems were a little bit weaker, you might have to do some staking on it. But ordinarily left to its own devices in the full sight suns, full sun sites um, that it loves, it is self-supporting. Really a, a, an interesting um, straw. And this is something that has enough presence. You could use it as a focal point specimen in place of a summer shrub, um, or you could use it in masses, of, again, of three or five. Queen of the Prairie, um, passing by at 60 miles an hour, could for a second be um, mistaken for the Joe Pye weed. But when you look closely, it has a very different leaf and you have that same nice, that, and I, I love pink flowers. So I really love that dusty pink flower on there. This plant gets really tall. This can be five to six feet tall. And it does have a tendency, again, this is a, um, I don't want to say colonizing shrub, but it is a walking shrub. So having grown this plant in the past, um, every year it sends out little roots and you'll have a stem that will be six or eight or 10 or 12 inches away from the mother plant. So allow plenty of space for Queen of the Prairie uh, because she will spread and get bigger and fill in. Uh, it can get five to seven feet tall, so it is really, really tall and five feet wide. This plant, because of the height of it, this plant might need um, a little bit of uh, light screen, uh, light staking. So this will test your metal on getting nice stakes and doing it uh, artfully so that you do, don't see the staking on it. But notice how it's at the top of this fence, and this fence is probably six feet tall. So a grouping of those could... Um, hide something that you don't want to see when you're out in the uh, in the garden in the summer and you don't necessarily want to have a fence. This is herbstone and herbstone probably needs staking too. Uh, this is one of the cone flowers. This is one of the tallest 
Herbstone is just a selection of the native um, sunflower, uh, uh, Rebecca, and it does need staking. It has a very long bloom season. And so for those of you that want a big, splashy, showy native um, that can give you a presence, again, if you notice, you don't see anything um, about what is behind that plant. So good temporary um, perennial screening. This can be seven feet tall and three feet wide. And you have these bright golden yellow flowers. Um, flowers are effective for a long period of time, as I mentioned earlier, from August to October. And the seed heads, if you leave the seed heads on, those are great for birds. So, but the seeding is not a problem with this one. Okay. Um, I think a lot, there aren't a lot of perennials that have an evergreen presence, but what a nice bonus that is when your perennial doesn't melt down to zero and you have a big hole in the garden all winter long. So I wanted to feature a few things that have a winter presence. And one of my real favorites is the Hartley Virginia. The other common name for this is pig squeak. And for those of you that are musically inclined, if you want to practice, um, and you might do this when no one else is home. Um, you go out and you take a leaf between your hands and there's this thing that you do where you kind of pinch it and it's supposed to make a little bit of a squeak because it's a very thick, rubbery, uh, beautiful leaf. And then top right hand corner, uh, you have this wonderful later spring flower in ordinarily, there are a number of selections, but ordinarily they are in this beautiful pink color. Uh, they look a little bit like a, a, a miniature hyacinth. And then in the fall, if this is out where it gets good some sun, you, it takes on this maroon purple fall color and stays that way over the winter. So it has a really, really, really nice presence. This is a plant that likes moisture. And it's, I find that it really benefits um, even in our heavier clay soils that are moderately high in fertility. This is a plant that um, when you're doing your spring cleanup and dead leafing, because you never cut this plant back, all you do in this over the winter, like the hellebores, you assess the leaves that don't look good and you have to cut those off because they're a little bit wiry. You cut those off and then the new leaves emerge. But what I would often suggest is top dressing. Just get a bag of compost or take compost from your compost pile and spread that lightly, maybe a quarter or half an inch layer of that over the top of the whole bed. Um, you don't have to fertilize it, but it really, really, really likes that organic matter. And if, you have, if it's a highly organic soil and you keep it evenly moist during the summer heat, um, especially if you have put it out in the sun, uh, you'll get a bed that looks like this. So this is a really, really good one. It will tolerate um, half day of shade. It's perfectly happy with that. Um, and moist soils are probably to be preferred. It's never going to be aggressive. It's never going to um, get out of bounds. Um, it will spread and creep a little bit. So the, the, the colony expands, but it's not um, a wild colonator. Coral bells. Coral bells are perhaps uh, best labeled as semi-evergreen because they will retain these amazing colors that the hybridizers have developed. Um, they need a well-drained soil over the winter. Um, when people lose them, ordinarily it's because they didn't amend the soil. They put them in a low spot where it's wet. These coral bells cannot be um, in a wet spot over the winter. They will very often freeze. And the other thing that I find with them um, is that because of the evergreen nature of them, you know, that leaf, that rosette of foliage typically stays about mm, eight inches tall and anywhere from eight to 12 inches wide. It has a tendency because it keeps the leaves, it has a tendency for leaves to blow in and cling and stay around the crown of the plant. And that also increases the water or holding capacity of the plant. And if it freezes like that, that can be a cause of mortality.
So because you're not cutting it back in the fall, make sure that right before the ground freezes, go out and check. And any leaves that have blown in around there, make sure that you get those off the crown of the plant. So this is not a plant that you're going to shred your leaves or shred your grass clippings and bury that plant for the winter. That is a recipe for disaster and dead hookeras. So make sure it's lots of organic matter, well-drained, and don't let things um, freeze over the top of the plant. You do have um, the little bell-like flowers, um, typically in shades of pink, but mostly they're grown for these wonderful um, different foliage colors that you have. They make nice, neat, tidy rosettes. They stay as nice, um, tidy rosettes. And so in the spring, what will happen is you will do what we call dead leafing, and typically it will be going in with a pair of little scissors and you'll be cutting out the, the spent foliage or the foliage that doesn't look great and then the new foliage will emerge and come up over the top of that so really really minimal maintenance with these the other thing is they can't um, heave out of the ground so make sure that you have them in the ground and they're well established going to winter don't plant these in october because with if we have a freeze thaw winter where it's warm and cold and warm and cold they if they're not established they will have a tendency to come out of the ground and expose the root system and that would also be a reason where you uh, might be more apt to lose them um, over the winter This is a perennial that gets overlooked again on the benches when it's not in bloom. And it has a very, um, this is evergreen. This is candy tuft. There is an annual candy tuft and there is a perennial candy tuft. And it looks great in rock gardens. It's a little low kind of a mat former that gets eight inches tall. It can spread anywhere from eight to 12 inches wide but it has a very, very, very prolonged season of spring bloom. Um, I've had them in bloom for up to three weeks. And really the only maintenance you do with them is as soon as they finish blooming, you go into a pair of scissors, not pruners, because they're a little bit wiry, so you want something sharp. And you literally just scissor off the spent flowers. You may want to trim around the edges so that when you look at it in drone's eye view after you finish, um, you have a nice rounded clump and it's symmetrical and you've gotten all the seed heads off and you leave it that way over the winter. So it has an evergreen presence. You do not cut this back to the ground in the fall or you do not cut it back to the ground in the spring. You let it winter over with that nice, really dark green needle like leaf. Um, definitely a sun plant, um, can tolerate some heat uh, this would be one that would be a great foreground front of border plant. Um, if you had a little raised area that, where you were using creeping flocks, it would give you that same effect, a low um, flat top moundy um, ground cover. Six to 10 inches tall. Um, typically, it could, after many years, it could be as wide as 18 inches, but sun for this one. Bugleweed, um, ajuga. Um, this is one I like in particular for the texture. Uh, the leaves are scalloped, and if they're outward, this will tolerate a lot of shade. Um, so probably the best situation for this would be half sun, half shade, because again, you have that black purple coloration. And as I mentioned earlier, that coloration is most intensified by at least four hours of sun. It doesn't really matter whether it's morning or afternoon. Um, and then you get this bonus of this mid-spring flower. It's actually darker than that. It's a real, it's almost a royal blue color and it's like a little hyacinth. So the plant itself, the black scallop is maybe two to three inches tall with the flower on it. It's four to six inches tall. And then when the flower is finished, um, what I do is I just go through with a pair of head shears and literally just lop off the flowers um, because they're not particularly ornamental and it detracts from that nice shiny foliage. Um, notice in this right hand picture, this is a perfect example of contrast and notice how that Lysimachia, uh, the Creeping Jenny, that chartreuse color, how it plays so well and it really intensifies the black of the scallop uh, ajuga, and vice versa, the scallop really brings up the light color of the Creeping Jenny. So that is um, a super way to use contrast in the garden. 
Um, this can have a tendency by spring, um, if we have a winter where it's been bitterly cold and we haven't had a lot of snow cover, it can look a little tattered. Don't bother dead leafing it. Um, as soon as it kicks in and comes out of winter dormancy, it will start growing and it will cover up all of that old spent foliage and it'll look just like this. You'll have a really, really, and it'll fill in very, very quickly. Um, while it colonizes a bit, um, it's not that aggressive because the runners are above ground. They're not underground like Pachysandra. So if it starts running into its neighbors, you literally um, pull it up before it starts rooting. Uh, and it can, if you have it at the edge of a lawn, it can start running in the lawn. But again, because it's sitting on top of the ground before it roots, you can literally just take a pair of scissors or you can take a pair of, head, of um, leaf, um, uh, grass shears and just scissor those off to keep that uh, contained within its, its space. Okay, alternative ground covers. How many of you have enough Vinca, have enough Pachysandra, have enough uh, Euonymus, the, the standard for ground covers, enough ivy? Um, there are lots and lots of great sedges and so especially um, these selections that are gold or chartreuse leaf. And again, this is a perfect example. You get this beautiful arching habit on the bull's golden. If it's in sun, when it first comes out in the spring, it's a bright, bright, bright gold color. And then in shade or as the summer progresses, it will tend to be, it will tend to green off a little bit and you'll have more of a chartreuse gold, but you have that beautiful arching. So you can see how a group of maybe three or five of those um, really will lighten up um, a shaded area. They're perfectly happy, as I mentioned before, even these more ornamental um, colored foliage selections of sedge do beautifully in uh, shade and in moist. And if you notice the picture on the right, you're seeing how the flowers, and so they're really insignificant. Um, you, there's, it would be tedious. Even I don't go in and prune those off. You just leave them and they kind of become, they, when they finish, they kind of dry up and they get lost kind of in the foliage. So um, these might be uh, the body of the plant without flowers is probably 10 inches tall and they can be with that arching over, the, they could be maybe 12 inches plus wide. But again, they make nice little clumps. This doesn't seed about, it doesn't walk, it stays exactly where it's placed. So this is a great way to light up a shaded area. Okay, one of my favorites. Um, I've been in horticulture a long time, so it's been interesting over the decades that I've done this to see uh, plants come and plants go. And this Japanese forest grass is, has been on the market now probably at least 10 years or more because there are nice selections. In nature, it is a dark green color, which I will show you in just a minute, but there are white variegated varieties like this one. There are golden green varieties and there is a solid chartreuse gold color um, variety called all gold. And the beauty of these is that they're clump forming and everybody is always asking, what are the best uh, grasses for ornamental grasses for shade? This is probably a really good substitute because these can go in uh, sun as long as they're moist. Uh, partial shade is probably the best situation, or if they have to, they can go in full shade. The cool thing about them is they arch over very gracefully and they tend to self cover to the ground. So you have each plant is this arching mass of gentle, um, gently textured foliage. And with the color on there, it makes an amazing color contrast. In the winter, um, they all, regardless of what color they are during the growing season, they all become kind of a straw or gray color, cream color, and they stay that way over the winter. And then you cut them back to the ground in the spring and you get a totally um, fresh flush of um, foliage on them. Uh, flowers are really, really, really insignificant. But again, this is a good one for partial shade, part sun, and they respond, they, they, once they're established, they can take a drier soil if they're in shade, but they just stay more lush and full and the clumps are much heavier um, if they have even moisture. 
This is a super, super perennial. Um, and if you don't have it in your partial shade garden or your shade garden, this is something to uh, look into. This is the dwarf goat's beard. And either one of those pictures, look at that delicate foliage. And while it looks delicate, the stems are wiry. And unless you have a deer go through, or unless one of the kids or somebody puts a foot in it, um, it makes this beautiful, mounded, perfectly mounded mushroom shape that is perhaps without flowers on it, um, maybe 10 inches tall and 15 inches wide. And then soon, it's not flowering yet, but early summer, you get these little white flowers on there um, that are really presented well with that dark green, and it's a really dark green, lacy foliage. It's, it's just an incredible plant. And I take the flowers off, but you could leave them on. Um, and in the fall, if it gets some sun, it has the potential to get a nice burgundy purple fall color. Um, and this is one that the animals um, leave alone, but it's, you can put this in very deep shade. Best situation is probably morning sun and afternoon shade, but I really like this plant. It's so tidy, it's so predictable. Um, it's a great foreground plant in the, uh, in the perennial border. Okay, now here's the green version of the Japanese forest grass. And for those of you that frequent um, the Chicago Botanic Garden, down by the Carillon, on the south side of the Carillon, is an enormous mass planting of this Japanese forest grass. And the, Jap the, the green variety, the naturally occurring species, seems to stand up a little bit taller, as you can see here, and might be 18 inches tall. But notice how it arches over. It's almost like, like water cascading. And so with it sitting up a little higher like that, the least little bit of wind moves that. And so it's like seeing a wheat field moving back and forth. The movement it brings to the garden is really, really, really nice. Love this green one. Mukdinia, um, hard to say, but worthwhile. Um, it's not always readily available, but we try and carry it in the spring. Um, this has a dark green leaf when it first comes out, and this picture on the left really doesn't do it justice. It's really a shiny leaf, and you have these little white flowers, and then later in the summer, all of a sudden, the leaves start streaking a little bit, and then you get this amazing maroon crimson color on the ends of the leaves, which is probably about the best fall color that you're going to get of any perennial that I can think of. Um, this plant is bounded, and so it's seldom more than 15 to 18 inches tall. Probably 15 is about it. And when it's established, the clumps can get 20-ish. Not I have never had them get 24 inches wide, but certainly at least a foot and a half wide. So it makes this nice clump, and you can leave it up over the winter. Um, and then do your pruning in the, the spring on that. So we have one more challenging situation. Oh, no, I guess that's it. I'm so sorry. I got behind in my, uh, where I was in, my, in the handout. So now I'd love to take questions. And my technical expert is bringing them in. Okay. Okay. Um, have a question here from Mark and Shade Friendly Sedges. Um, I had given a list to our buyer, so hopefully it's Friday. Um, we will have to check and see because typically a lot of our perennial orders come in on Friday and, and Thursday and Friday for the weekend. So we had tons and tons of them. So evidently people respond to that. We should have more sedges coming in. Um, ba, 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 ba. Becky, Mangan, Becky had asked for a handout. Yes, Becky, uh, there is a handout um, that you can access. And uh, we will give you, I, since I know you as a former Chalet employee, I will call you on how to get that handout. When are hardy hibiscus available in the season for purchase? Um, Cara, that's a great question. Typically they are later, um, because one of the things I did fail to mention, this is a great point, the hardy hibiscus are 
one of the very last things to emerge from the garden in the spring. So the soil has to get fairly warm. And so we don't bring them in until very often um, latter part of May, because if the growers haven't put some heat on them um, later in the winter, they're just sitting in the pots and people are concerned and they don't want to buy them until they see them. So um, starting now in the next few weeks, they should be available and we may even have them available um, as blooming plants a little bit um, later. Um, do you plant do you plant Lenten roses? Um, I do not know exactly what that means. I'm sorry, I have to pass on that. Are there any specific hellebores you would recommend? I'm looking for something with brighter green foliage as opposed to darker green foliage. Um, that's a great question, Christine. Um, challenging question. Typically what you would do then, um, we do get generic hellebores in the spring that are grown from seed. And so those are ones that you would buy when they're in bloom so that you see exactly what the color is. And there is, like many flowers, there is a fairly good correlation that lighter foliage telebores are going to be lighter um, flower colors. Um, but if you want um, brighter green, then stay away from the ones that are the burgundies or the reds or the dark, um, the dark pinks. But what you might be looking for is um, you might go ahead and look for the lighter flowered ones uh, in the seedlings. Um, why are my hardy geraniums so leggy? They're looking full in your photos. Um, hardy geraniums will tolerate some shade, but I'm wondering, Kara, if you have them in a good bit of shade um, or if you're fertilizing them. Uh, hardy geraniums are not particularly needy so, and you want to give them lots of sun. And the other thing that might cause them to grow upright and leggy is if you have one of those um, English style gardens where everything is really touching their neighbor. And so if they're having to compete for light, that will also cause the cells to elongate and get taller and then they will get stretchy. So don't fertilize, give them enough space and then they will tend to be um, more vertical and they will tend to, um, grow out. I, uh, Mark, I planted coral bells last fall, which did not do well this spring. Quite a few died. They were receiving heavy afternoon sun. It is one of the darker varieties. Um, there's not really a difference in the darker varieties. It's all about, to me, it's all about the drainage over the winter. This was a fairly mild winter, so I would suggest that if you lost some of them, that perhaps the soil was too heavy, or indeed, as I mentioned, that leaves or other things had kind of blown in against them or over the top of the plant and kept the plant soggy wet over the winter, they absolutely will not tolerate that. Um, Cara, salvia, good pollinators too. Um, salvia is one that uh, I have hit and miss luck with them, tend not to come back. Um, and they get leggy and full of insect holes in foliage. Any advice? Um, salvia, yes, is good for pollinators. Um, that's a pretty, generally speaking, um, a pretty ironclad thing. So if you lost them over the winter, again, I would have to suggest that maybe the drainage isn't as good as it should be. And while they're not fussy, um, you don't want them wet over the winter. They have a, a fibrous root system um, that might check out on you if they're constantly wet. Uh, from CAG, my lamb's ears have rusted, it seems. Have not had this before and I'm careful about clearing the bottoms out for airflow. Um, again, I have never grown lamb's ear, but I've also, um, it, it will get fungal issues if we have a, but just because of the way it rests on the ground and with all of that rain that we had in May, I could see where there may be um, fungal issues, leaf spots, or the leaves actually might start rotting on it. So this is simply a matter of taking off of those um, spent leaves. And as you said, doing everything, clearing out the bottoms for airflow. And if it's an old established bed and the plants are growing over each other, you may have to physically get in there and thin those out. Um, do you feel coconut coir is a good additive to one's compost for perennials? Absolutely. When you're, when you're looking for organic matter, you're looking for the coarsest thing possible. So anything that has fibers, anything that has a presence, anything that isn't too small and compact, 
um, will do a nice job of that. And that's why we typically don't recommend peat moss unless you're one of those people that lives along the edge of the lake, um, what I would call the sand ridge there. And you can see that you have a sand, high sand component in there. Um, you can use peat for that because peat acts as a binder and helps retain the moisture in the sandy soil so you don't have to water as often. But conversely, it does exactly the same thing in peat in, in the clay soil. Uh, and what you don't want in a clay soil is you don't want more uh, moisture retention. You want to open up pore spaces so that water runs right through and that you have better drainage. So we really recommend peat only for people that have a, uh, that know that they have a sandy soil component. So the coconut coir would be a great organic. And the cool thing about coconut coir is that, of course, it is a renewable um, organic resource. Um, Thank you all. I hope this was worthwhile and stay tuned next week. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the presentation is, but for you, those of you that want to have your uh, brain tickled and brain challenged, it is actually going to be a bit of a quiz. And uh, I am suggesting to marketing that the, what I would like to do is uh, myths and fables of horticulture and maybe dispel some things that you've been doing as common garden practices and um, for those of you that uh, got in a little bit later or that missed the first part or had to check out early, um, you can go to YouTube and these, will all, these presentations and classes will all be available on YouTube. Thank you so much for attending. Have a great week. Bye.